Hi, I'm Vanessa Warheit. I work with Actera on EV charging equity on behalf of Plugin America, and I run the partnerships program for Atmos Financial. I am delighted to introduce to you this evening Professor Mark Jacobson, who has prepared remarks for this action breakout session. I'm going to read to you Mark's fairly lengthy bio, but as someone who has worked with Mark for many years, I also want to personally mention that he has been an unflagging, dedicated champion of solving the climate crisis at the pace and scale required. Our movement owes him and his groundbreaking work a huge debt of gratitude. So Mark Z. Jacobson is Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Stanford University, where he is also Director of the Atmosphere and Energy Program, Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment, and Senior Fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy. He is also the co-founder of the Solutions Project and 100.org, and he has been a distinguished leader in the movement for 100% clean, renewable energy. Mark's career has focused on better understanding air pollution and global warming problems and on developing large scale, clean, renewable energy solutions. Toward that end, he has developed and applied three dimensional atmosphere, biosphere, ocean computer models and solvers to simulate air pollution, weather, climate and renewable energy. He has developed roadmaps for transitioning states and countries to 100% clean, renewable energy for all purposes. And he has developed computer models to examine grid stability as we bring more renewable energy online. Without further ado, here's Mark. Can you explain a little bit about how you got into this space and what's motivating for you around renewable energy sources? I, yeah, well, I actually was interested in trying to understand and solve air pollution problems when I was a teenager, when I was around 13 years old. I would travel to Los Angeles and San Diego and to try to, to play tennis and I, out, outdoors and the air pollution is horrible back then. I mean, it's still the worst in the United States in Los Angeles, but it's much better than it was. But back then I thought, why should people live like this? It was just choking smog. And I thought this is a problem I wanted to understand and solve eventually. And that's when I started going to college. Uh, that's what I dedicated my uh, studies toward and I told myself this is what I want to do when I grow up basically and I ended mm -hmm. up uh, going to graduate school to study air pollution in Los Angeles and have had that goal to understand and solve large-scale pollution and climate problems ever since. It's amazing and we've been so appreciative of your continued support at Actera and the overlap between the work that we do and the work that you do has really had some amazing synergies I'm wondering what you're most excited about. This section that we're in, these breakout sessions are all about actions. What is the thing that really sparks your interest and what's upcoming, what's innovative that you're really excited about? Well, I'm excited by the fact that technologies for transitioning to renewable energy and that is not only the electricity generation, but also storage technologies, electric vehicles, heat pumps, uh, and electrified industrial technologies for high temperature processes. Uh, these technologies are not only growing and expanding, but they're coming down in cost, they're becoming more efficient, and we're seeing a large or widespread ad adoption of these technologies. And this is really what's exciting to me because, you know, 10 years ago, they were more expensive, they were not adopted very much, and people thought they were very niche. But now they're becoming mainstream. The United States is now 21% uh, renewable electricity, which is still a long way to go to get to 100%. Uh, and we need to transition all the other energy sectors. But it's a lot further than we were 10 years ago. Uh, so I'm excited by the fact that these technologies have come down across. And so now, you know, we have 95% of the technologies we need to transition today. Uh, the five percent we don't have are like long distance ships and aircraft uh, mostly the, we have we know how to do it but we don't have the electric versions or hydrogen fuel cell versions uh, that we'll need to actually transition those sectors and you know there are a few other industrial technologies we don't have yet but we do know how to do that so we do have 95 percent of what we need the, the technologies are lower in cost now and this is very encouraging. So it's technically and economically possible to transition to 100% clean renewable energy and storage for all purposes, uh, but we do still have social and political barriers. 
How do you see that transition working in marginalized or frontline communities? I mean, one of the things that Terra focuses a lot on is equitable transition, making sure that adoption is accessible to all communities. Do you see how either COVID or environmental justice is shaping that transition? Well, COVID has shaped um, the transition in a, well, mostly in a way that was unexpected at first, but in retrospect was, makes sense. Uh, energy consumption went down significantly. And as a result, air pollution went down significantly uh, in major cities of the world during COVID because people were just using less energy. And so they were they were staying at home, so weren't commuting. So was lot, there was a lot less traffic, a lot less air pollution from traffic. Emissions went down from global uh, that affect climate. Uh, so air pollution and climate relevant emissions decreased. So that was an ironic benefit of COVID, although it did not um, was was not for a good reason because COVID was so devastating to lots of people's lives. Can you talk a little bit about the role of policy and how cities and counties are playing a role in this transition and what they're doing now that's really positive and maybe what they're doing that's not so positive and they need to play a little catch up, but that role of policy specifically and how we move these things forward? Well, we need the combination of policies at the city, state, national levels and international levels and individual actions to affect a large change. And to that end, there are over 180 cities now in the United States alone that have committed to 100% renewable, uh, either electricity or in the most, almost all the cases or sometimes energy, which is all energy. Uh, and that's really important. I mean, once you have a commitment, then things start to get done and you have a goal and, we, and then plans are made to actually shoot for uh, that goal. And they're not only all these cities, but there are 17 states and territories in the US that have commitments for 100% renewable electricity. And so these are very important and really what's driving a transition, but it's not, it's not only actually cities and, and states, but also businesses. There are 340 international businesses, including eight of the 10 biggest businesses in the world that have committed to 100% renewable. So they're building wind and solar farms to run their own operations. Uh, thereby replacing, re getting rid of uh, fossil fuel electricity for their energy. So these, so there, those are policies that are, have been implemented already, but we need a lot more. And this is really important, but in, on top of that, individuals can make, take action in their own lives, uh, transitioning their own homes, uh, or even if, you're, if you have an apartment, you can opt often for a community choice aggregation utility that can provide 100% renewable electricity for you at the same cost as a fossil, as fossil electricity. Uh, and being more energy efficient using uh, implementing, putting in energy efficient light bulbs like LED light bulbs, uh, insulation, going to electric vehicles. Next time you have to buy a vehicle, get an electric vehicle, electric heat pumps for air heating, water heating, air conditioning. These are all very energy efficient appliances. Trying to get rid of natural gas in buildings, that's a key step. So that's what individuals can do on their own or policies can be implemented at the city level. And I think in, the, in California, there are uh, close to 40 or more uh, towns and cities that uh, now, now require the elimination of natural gas to some degree in buildings. Mm -hmm. So that's really needed to affect a good transition as well. What are you seeing as the biggest barrier challenge to us, either as individuals or as cities, counties moving forward into renewables? Well, the biggest barrier, the, aside from special interests, there's a lot, you know, people <laughs> aside in, the, <laughs> from that. in the fossil fuel industry, there are a lot of people who make a lot of money. So they're going to naturally yeah. be against the transition. And then there are lobbyists, of course. But there are also people who, propose different solutions. So there's competing solutions that are really a barrier. And I mentioned carbon capture, blue hydrogen, people, there are people who support nuclear power, bioenergy, all these things have marginal to sometimes no benefit whatsoever and sometimes disbenefit in terms of social costs because they increase air pollution, increase mining, and hardly reduce any carbon. So the thing is we need to focus on what works and what works is clean renewable energy and storage. So that's uh, wind, solar, geothermal, electricity, and heat, uh, mostly existing hydroelectric power, uh, some tidal, some wave power, 
and and then we need heat pumps for buildings for air and water heating or conditioning uh, as i mentioned energy efficiency in buildings led lights electric induction cooktop stoves uh, no gas in buildings uh, for transportation electric vehicles hydrogen fuel cell vehicles for industry electrify everything and so if we focus on things that work and not but not focus on things that don't work, like as I mentioned, carbon capture, direct air capture, blue hydrogen, nuclear power, bioenergy, these are all distractions, things that are higher social cost, less benefit, and sometimes no benefit. Uh, if we focus on what works, then we can go the furthest. And so the biggest danger is, not, is getting distracted by things that don't work. And otherwise, because we only have eight years to solve 80% of the problem, we have to do 80% by 2030 and ideally 100% of the problem by 2035, but certainly no later than 2050. So my next question is going to be tricky. You've talked a lot about the success factors and things that Actera and Actarans in our community understand really, really well. Where do you think we will be by 2030? What is the hopeful picture that we can leave for folks if these things happen? What, what does our country look like? What does the world look like by 2030? Well, ideally by 2030, we will have at least 80% of our electricity transition to clean renewable electricity, 80% of our vehicles transition to electric or hydrogen fuel cell, 80% uh, of our industry electrified, 80% of our buildings having no gas and running all on electricity that's clean renewable electricity and with lots of solar on rooftops. So that's what is ideal, and we can do it technically and economically. Uh, but we do need a concerted effort. People have to be behind it. Policies need to be put in place. We need to be aggressive about it. And we can't get distracted by things that don't work. And we do not, but we do not need miracle technologies. We have what we 95% of what we need. Uh, so I'm optimistic that we can do it, but it's really lining people up and educating them about what's possible. That's that's another barrier because most people just are not aware. Maybe some people don't care, but if the people who do care, a lot of people are not aware of what's possible. And that's kind of my job is to try to educate the public and policymakers. To that end, yeah, I write a lot of papers and books and stuff and try to get that information out to large numbers of people. But you know, only I don't reach lots and lots of people, but I try my best. You do too. I think that's why we appreciate so much what you're doing, because it is about reaching people and doing the very best we can to get to those folks. And, and I appreciate also the hopefulness that you have, because we have hope too, right? We wouldn't be doing this if we didn't have hope about the outcome.